On today's video, I'm going to be taking this Gateway P575 and maxing it out. It's currently got 40 mega RAM, uh, 8 gig hard drive, and Windows 95. We're going to be putting a Pentium 133 in there, 128 mega RAM, 160 gig hard drive with this Promise ATA100 controller card. Now, it's currently running Windows 95. We're going to throw something on there a little newer. Stay tuned. So first thing, let's get everything out that needs to come out. First off, the processor. Now, there was a retaining clip on there. I already popped that off when I was prepping for this video, and I wasn't about to put it back on. Uh, they're not as easy as they are now. So you also want to be careful not to bend these pins if you ever have to put this thing back in. Uh, <laughs> I had the unfortunate uh, joy of doing that when I was getting ready for this video, and I had to bend all those pins back. That was not fun. I did make it work, though. And I made a short out of it. Check it out. So we can put the processor in here. Uh, I opt to place the fan with the power header in that direction. Now, the other thing I want to show off here is this little cable I made, because when you buy a $5 processor on eBay, sometimes it doesn't come with the cables that you need. So you just have to be careful. You just want to make sure that the ground pin is on the center and the positive pin is on the outside. That should just drop right in, nice and easy. Now the RAM is a little harder, because uh, that has all the cables in the way. So let's pull this stuff out quick. Not going to need this cable anymore. Now the RAM can be a little difficult to pop out with these metal clips, and thankfully they are metal clips, not the fragile plastic ones but I use just the edge of the RAM carefully pressing on the clip itself and they come right out. Okay, take the new RAM, make sure it's slotted correctly and it should just pop right in, just like that. You definitely never wanna fight RAM. So if it doesn't fit, uh, Take another look at it, make sure it's incorrect, make sure it's keyed correctly, make sure you're hitting it at the correct angle because you want to kind of come in at a 45 degree angle when you're coming in with this particular ram. It should sit kind of like that and then clip right in. You don't want to fight it, you don't want to force it. There you go. That is all in there nice and tight. Go ahead and let's empty my remaining PCI slot. Take that out. Put our promise card in there. On the promise ATA 100 card, you do have two cable connections here and you wanna use one for your hard drive and for this particular board, uh, because the board itself does not support booting from USB, the card does. So you want to take your CD-ROM and zip drive or whatever else you got connected and slap that right into your second connection here. Now you want to be careful that you're not impeding airflow over your processor. That's definitely one of the important things right there. Now there is a fan connection here for the front fan and that was blowing air over the CPU uh, when it didn't have a fan. Now it has a fan. I'm going to leave it unplugged for the video because it is a very loud fan. Uh, I will plug it back in later, but for the video, I'm not going to leave that plugged in. And then we need one more for the hard drive. Plug the hard drive power in. I'm going to carefully lay that cable down where it's not going to impede the fan. Lay on top of it, get in the way. Anything like that. Then you kind of just want to hide all the cables that you can hide. And there you go. That is the complete system. Originally on this install, I was going to use a SCSI adapter. Unfortunately, the SCSI adapter I have has an old BIOS and it doesn't support any SCSI drive over eight, eight and a half gig. So that wouldn't have been of much use for me for what I want to do. It's not even flashable, so you'd have to replace the actual chip with a newer BIOS revision. So this card, as far as I'm concerned, is useless for what I need it for. Uh, it's going to go back on the shelf. Uh, maybe one day I'll find the right chip for it, but it's not that important. 
I almost forgot to mention that when you upgrade the processor on this board, there are dip switches that you have to change in order to report to the motherboard what processor you have. On this particular motherboard, I have this dip switch 8 and dip switch 6 that I need to change in order to re report 133 megahertz Pentium. So I'm going to go ahead and pop those over real quick. And as you can see, they are now in the on position. Everything else is off. And that's pretty much all you have to do. Some people have used that for overclocking. Uh, as far as I'm aware, on 133 is as far as this board can go. I couldn't find any documentation from Intel suggesting otherwise. Uh, I do know they made 200 megahertz. I wouldn't know which dip switches to move around. I could do tr uh, some trial and error, but I just wanna get it working. I'm very happy with the 133 that's in there right now. And let's see how it works. We're gonna go ahead and install Tiny Core Linux. All right, so this is a great sign. We've got 133 megahertz. The 128 mega RAM is showing up. Uh, nothing is in the wrong spot, luckily. Let's go to the BIOS quick and just make sure everything's proper. Uh, we got our date, time, Pentium 133, that's great. Extended memory is 130,048 kilobyte, 128 mega RAM. And that is everything I need to do. So let's go ahead and just exit discarding changes. Now that the hardware upgrade is complete, the first thing I want to do is make sure that the hard drive inside has no partitions left over on it. Any additional partitions, the OS will try to write uh, to the hard drive, and when you go to format it, it'll say it's in use, it's a whole thing. This is the easiest way I've found to do it. I have a Windows 98 SE boot disk right here, so I'm going to pop that in, turn the computer on real quick. What we're going to do is we're going to boot to the floppy drive, and we're going to run fdisk. Now, the disk I have here, uh, there is like an error on the floppy itself, but fdisk runs. That's all that's important. I don't, don't need to install Windows 98. I don't need to do any additional DOS drivers. Just fdisk. That's all I need. All right, the screen came up here, so we're going to go down to no CD-ROM support for what we're doing. This is the quickest way. Okay, we're here at the A prompt, so I'm just going to type in fdisk, F-D-I-S-K, enter. Do you wish to enable large disk support? Yes, doesn't really matter because we're going to format it again, but this gets us on the right track. Now that we have fdisk open, I want to go ahead and display the partition information so I can see what's on this drive. Uh, there's a primary DOS partition on here, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Uh, so you want to hit number three for delete partition or logical DOS drive. Uh, I'm going to hit number one after that for primary partition. And then it says uh, all the data will be lost. Obviously, that's the goal. Enter volume label, there is no label, hit enter. And then are you sure? Are you really sure? And that's it. So once that was done, we're done with fdisk. I can get out of here. I can go ahead and eject that disk, open the CD-ROM drive, take our 29 meg CD here, because that's as small as uh, Tiny Core is, and put the disk in, control it, delete, and we should be good to go. So we're gonna watch it come up here. Uh, you're gonna notice that the ATA100 card picks up that there is a bootable CD in the drive. That's great. Uh, if this were the computer itself doing it without that promise card, it wouldn't have done that. So here we are at Tiny Core. I'm gonna go ahead and boot Tiny Core. I don't have to wait for USB for a slow device because there is no USB on this computer at all. That's why we're doing everything through the network and everything through that one CD-ROM. The boot process itself does take a couple of minutes because it is an older computer. Uh, that's to be expected. Okay, here we are at the beginning. It's about to boot into the graphical uh, user interface, GUI, and a cute little uh, penguin here. So there's always gotta be a penguin. And here we are at the desktop. Now, a word of advice, I did find out the hard way that when it boots up for the first time, it sets your resolution. Now, you can change your resolution in the settings later, but I went ahead and tried to install a different monitor uh, for the video here. I originally did this on a CRT, and because they don't quite come across on video great, I decided to use an LCD, and it wouldn't boot at all. And then when I put the CRT back to change the resolution, it still wouldn't boot at all. So. To say the least, there's definitely some hiccups and bugs with Tiny Core. Uh, it's to be expected when you're trying to use it on hardware this old. I'm sure if you use this on a newer system, you might not have as many bugs. Uh, yet again, it is a very 
very tiny kernel of Linux. You can fit this thing on the tiniest thumb drive and that's all you need. Uh, it's great the fact that it works, but if you notice there's no file manager, there's no web browser, there's literally not even an installer for this thing without me downloading it. So let's go ahead and get that started. You wanna to go to the apps download icon right here in the middle. Click on that. It's gonna ask me which mirror if I wanna find out which is the fastest. I'm gonna say no, cause it doesn't matter for how slow this computer is. I could be connecting to the furthest mirror away and it's still faster than this thing can handle. Uh, after that, you go to apps, cloud remote and browse. Give it a second to come up here. You wanna type in TC tech install tech GUI. Now, depending on if you're prior military or not, when you type something, tack something, it's a dash. So you wanna go ahead and highlight the TC install, hit go, and it will go ahead and download the package. It'll also tell you the little code, or the little command here you could have run in terminal, TC tack load, tack WI, space TC, tack install, tack GUI, dot TCZ long, a lot of letters there, but you type that out and you would basically see this little window here in your terminal. Now, mind you, all of this is loading into RAM. Uh, there is currently no partition on that hard drive for this to write to, so you have to have enough RAM for that to load. Now, the system itself takes up about 40 meg right there. Uh, the download here is probably another five or six meg just for the installer, so you're gonna want to have as much RAM as you can get into your old system. Now, I got lucky and happened to have 128 meg lying around I could use in this thing, and that's maxed out. I couldn't install any other live CD environment. Uh, this is the closest I can get to getting a good, new, up-to-date operating system on this thing. Uh, it's, just, it's just hard when you're dealing with these old computers with limited RAM. Uh, you you got to get really creative, and it's been a long time since I've had to get creative with this type of old hardware. Everything I do at work is all you know new Linux, and it's so much more streamlined. Get going back to the old ways kind of puts you in your place. Okay, so just finished installing the TC install GUI. Uh, you can see a new icon here that looks like a screw head. That's the tiny Linux or tiny core Linux uh, logo there. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the installer there and I'm not going to just open TC install. I wanna go ahead and open that from the terminal. Now the reason being is I was following directions initially uh, off the TC website and it wasn't working for me. So what I ended up doing is if you go to, T if you go to terminal, type in TC tech install and hit enter, it'll open up the TC installer program, and then you can actually see the background of what the application is actually doing. So when you go ahead to format your disk and everything, you're gonna see the format being completed on the command line behind it. What you wanna choose here is you wanna make sure that the path to the install file is on your CD-ROM drive. In my case, it's mount slash sr0 slash boot slash core dot gz. Uh, that's already auto-populated, it knows where it is. Uh, you could download from the internet if you got this far without it. Uh, you want to choose frugal, that's already checked. Hold disk and give it a second here. It found my hard drive. It has it under SDA instead of HDA, so it believes it's a SCSI drive or who knows, but that's what it sees. It sees SDA, fine for me. Uh, install bootloader is already checked. You want to choose ext4 for your formatting options. Next on that, now this is what hung me up. Uh, the install directions I was following had me uh, put a couple lines in here. I found if you leave it blank, uh, it just works. So I was up until 3 in the morning trying to make this video the other night. Uh, don't worry, I cleaned the shirt. <laughs> and I was pulling my hair out. I went to bed and I thought about it as I was falling asleep and I woke up the next day, tried again, and I was able to get it to work. So I finally got it working. 
I'm happy with the results. This is where we are now. So it's gonna in install the extensions from the library on your CD-ROM. It found that as well. And then it just confirms everything that you chose. Uh, it's a pretty vanilla install. So go ahead and hit proceed. And if you look up here, it says writing zeros to beginning of ID of dev slash SDA partitioning. Now, if you had a problem with any of this, uh, if it couldn't write to the disk or anything like that, it would just hang here and not even tell you. Uh, up here, uh, you see it's saying make E2FS, so make uh, file system basically. And it's creating the file system that we're gonna need to run uh, Tiny Core Linux on. So it's working. Now, the other day when I was trying this, because of permission issues, uh, the fact that the drive had partitions on it that Tiny Core was using as cache memory or whatever it was doing with it, it was mounted and I couldn't unmount it. Uh, I couldn't force unmount, I couldn't do anything, it was just using it. So I found out the best way to do it, like I said, delete the partitions, F disk on an old DOS boot disk is just fine. Uh, in my case, Windows 98 boot disk. Ignore this part because I've already made the drive. Uh, I'm doing the little pull the finished food out from beneath the counter during the cooking show. So I put a bad hard drive in there. I knew it might have been bad. It got me this far. We were able to see what the actual steps are. So here you go. It failed. This is something you'd want to see. And uh, in this case, it does just say error mounting USB device. The previous errors I was having uh, didn't even tell me that. So it was really a matter of, does this take this long? Like, does it normally take three hours to format a drive on this old computer? No, it should honestly take about 20 minutes. And uh, that was the problem I was having. It wasn't telling me what was going on. And I'm very happy that I got it working now. Now, like I said, I'm just gonna pull the dead drive out uh, and connect back the regular drive. And we're gonna do a clean boot uh, which I haven't done yet on this uh, new drive. I just know I installed it. So uh, I'm also going to show you a few things with the boot. Let's get to that. Okay, so let's do the boot from a clean install. So we're going to turn the computer on and we're going to let it boot up. Now, in my particular case, and I believe it is just because of the hardware that I'm using in this computer, the boot process takes about 13 minutes to boot up. That's unexceptionally long. Uh, once it's up and running, it does work a lot faster than you'd expect. Now, the problem I'm having is that I believe it's because of the controller card I have in here or the type of hard drive I'm using or whatever the case, it doesn't like something with that hard drive or the RAID controller card. So what it does is it hangs up for a long time until it finally fails out. Now there's probably a configuration file I could edit. I'll dig into that later. Uh, I don't really want to go over it because I believe that's a me problem using this particular hardware. So if you run this on your own computer and you don't have that hideous long boot time, uh, then consider yourself lucky. Uh, I do have a horrendously long boot. So we're going to see it in a minute here. Now, it's going to get to this point right here where it's going to start loading extensions. That takes 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Uh, it takes a little while. And then after this is where you start seeing the hang. And I'll show you that in a second. In fact, I'm going to set my stopwatch right here so we can see how long it takes. Here's the start. Okay, so that's the first error. You're going to see exception, emask, yada, 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 fail to command, write DMA. Uh, that normally would tell you that you have a bad hard drive. Now, I had this problem with other hard drives, uh, not the dead one I had before, but I believe it's not the drive. The drive is actually, you know, new old stock. I pulled it out of the box not too long ago and haven't really used it much. So I don't believe it's the hard drive. Uh, I do believe it's just something to do with the hardware configuration I've got going. So I'm going to fast forward this a bit and we'll see just how long it takes to go through all these errors. Thinking back on it now, I don't believe the 13 minute boot time was the normal first boot. Uh, it was when I was trying to reinstall the operating system uh, without formatting it. It took 13 minutes to boot up from that. So 
it's me misremembering. It was three in the morning, my fault. But this does still take a couple minutes for this to air out. Okay, so that was almost four minutes for that air to finally time out. Uh, I've been recording for about seven minutes, so subtract a minute for setting up after hitting record. So we are looking at about a six minute boot. Uh, not quite the 13 I originally thought I was thinking about, uh, but still pretty long time to boot up. Uh, I could take about four minutes off of that if I fix that uh, error at boot, uh, found out what it was looking for, remove that line from the boot up or whatever I had to do. Uh, that's something I can look into later, but I just want to get this working uh, to show you guys what we're looking at and what you could expect on your install. All right, now this is beautiful. When you're doing these installs and you're pulling your hair out at two in the morning, three in the morning, almost four in the morning until you say, I can't anymore and go to bed. Uh, the first time you see the desktop after successfully figuring out what you're doing wrong, it's beautiful. So this is purely what it is, beautiful. Now, I said it before, there's no file manager on here. There's no web browser, Chrome, nothing like that, no Firefox. Uh, in fact, Firefox probably wouldn't even work on this because it has to be 32-bit uh, for the thing that we're operating on here. It's not gonna work with a lot of software out there. Uh, that's just something you have to accept when you're working on an old 32-bit uh, CPU. So we are gonna install a web browser, uh, mainly Opera. Uh, we're also gonna install the file manager. I'll do that first, real quick. Once again, go to apps, cloud, browse. And I'm gonna type in XFE. We'll use that as our file manager. Now this install doesn't take too long. Uh, I do believe the Opera install takes a little while. All right, we have a file browser installed. So we can go ahead and open that up. And it is a little slow, old computer, comes with the territory. But here you go. We now have a browser or a file manager Go ahead and close that out. Now that the file manager is installed, let's go ahead and get a browser on here. Now on the directory here, we have uh, Chromium, Dillo, Edbrowse, Elinks, uh, Firefox, Get Latest. Uh, that's not gonna work for us, obviously. Seamonkey, Transmission. Uh, let's go ahead and try Dillo. Now, sometimes when you go to install something and it just hangs or doesn't go anywhere, it might be because of a certain dependency that it's trying to find and the dependency might not be compatible with 32-bit. So that, that's a few problems I had when I was trying to install Chromium. This seems to be working so far, so we'll see what it does when we get back. All right, so that didn't take too long, a couple minutes. Uh, let's go ahead and open up our new browser and see how well it works. Okay, here's our browser. Let's go ahead and uh, start some... We'll start on something light. Just google.com. Seems to work just fine. Uh, let's go to news, see how that loads. Okay, not terrible for how old this computer is. Uh, the format's a little wonky, but it's to kind of be expected when you're trying to use such a lightweight browser. All right, seeing how Google News loaded, uh, let's just try YouTube because I like pain and it doesn't seem like YouTube works. No surprise there. All right. So 68k.news does work. So that's a good sign at least. So let's try Opera. I know it's an older release, but let's just see if it works. All right. Let's see how Opera handles YouTube. All right. So I'm basically being told to update my browser. No surprise there. I didn't expect it to go too much further than this. At least it's showing me this. Uh, the other browser wouldn't get that far. Now, if I can't go to YouTube, I can only check basic sites. Uh, what is this good for? Well, this right here. If you want just a lightweight Linux distro uh, to run terminal commands, SSH, stuff like that, this is your go-to guy right here. You got your little terminal box right here. You can open that up. And if you have a server running somewhere, 
uh, you can SSH into it. Oh, I don't have SSH. You'd have to install that. There we go. Now we got SSH installed. See, this is that easy. This is a bare minimum Linux install. So you basically get the GUI and anything you want to throw on top of it. If you want web browsing, I wouldn't recommend it. It wouldn't work too well, but you might have uh, something old that you could use on your network. Now, in my case, I do have a uh, APC UPS, so I can, I can log into that. Here you go, right here, I can log into my UPS. Uh, if you have other web servers on your network, uh, in my case, uh, PDUs or my UPS, uh, I can do that. Now, one more thing I wanna try here. I haven't tried this ahead of time, so we're gonna do this together. I'm gonna see if I can get Office installed on here. So I'm just gonna type in Office and see what they have to offer. All right, LibreOffice right here. Let's go ahead and get that installed. It's 197 meg. This might take a minute. This is a 10 meg network card that is definitely bottlenecked by the CPU and RAM. Well, sad news, LibreOffice failed. Uh, there are a couple others, so let's see if they work. So GOffice also failed. Uh, more than likely it's due to the old 32-bit uh, processor is my guess. Uh, we just don't have uh, good luck with Office on this one. Not a big deal. There are plenty of other apps that we can look through real quick here. Well, there is FileZilla, so let's see if we can get that installed. At least it could be an FTP client. All right, so FileZilla did install and was able to launch. Uh, it's pretty much the same any FileZilla you've ever used. You get your host name, your username, password, port, all that stuff. Uh, now, it was a little slow as to be expected. Uh, now, my recommendation is if you want Linux on an old computer like this, it is useful if you wanna just tinker with it, uh, play around with it, obviously not a daily driver. Uh, if you wanna test your skill limits, uh, this definitely uh, took me a while to get this far. And if you like beating yourself up with old software on old computers, this is the uh, route for you to go. Uh, I am very happy I was able to get it this far. Uh, now, will I be continuing to use Linux on this computer? No, I am gonna eventually reinstall Windows 95, uh, get everything up and running. Now the partitions are gonna have to be 32 gig partitions on that hard drive, but at least that's plenty of space for all the Windows 95 games I'll ever need. Uh, it's a very useful computer uh, for those older games. Obviously, Windows 95 is what it was built for. I wouldn't put 98 on here necessarily. Uh, just really would hurt it in the end. Uh, now, keeping Linux on here, that's something I might end up doing in another route. Uh, I do believe what I will end up doing is I'm going to put a toggle switch in the back so that I can turn off the hard drive that's on the ATA 130 or 100 card. And uh, that way I can have a Windows 3.1 install on the main hard drive, have the second hard drive here on that promise card uh, loaded with Windows 95, and that little toggle switch can just go back and forth without me having to mess around with bootloaders or anything like that. So that's a future video I'll, I'll end up playing around with. Uh, but yeah, overall, Fun experience, very fun to tinker with, to explore the possibilities of what you can do with Linux and how far back you can go with this old hardware with modern software. Uh, that's something that I don't think they ever foresaw when they built this thing was that they'd be still having software made for it 30 some odd years in the future. So that's very interesting. Uh, I hope you like this video. Like, subscribe, tell your friends. Let me know in the comments what you think or what you would have uh, done differently. Thanks. Take care.